just in case it, I, I never know if it pops up on everyone's screen saying it's going to be recording. So I just want people to know that. Um, and so I'm going to uh, first let uh, Dr. Coughlin start us off, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker and move into our uh, event. Thanks, Chris. Um, as all of you know, and I got introduced to Mary a few minutes ago, I'm Marian Coughlin. I'm the Senior Associate VP for Academic Affairs. Um, I get the pleasure to represent Dr. Cooper this evening. Unfortunately, uh, she had a conflict that just arose in her schedule and was unable to be with us this evening. As Chris mentioned, she loves hosting this event on campus. She in particular enjoys pouring you folks a glass of wine afterwards and the chance to sort of mingle and talk and listen to our speaker and share in, you know, really good academic discussion with you folks around the important topics that Chris has brought many good speakers to us. So it's an event that we very much look forward to hosting back on campus. Um, and hopefully we will be able to do that um, next, in next, uh, next spring. And we'll look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, I don't think Chris could have found a better speaker for us in tonight's topic with all that we have been talking about and working on on campus uh, in terms of, of working with our BIPOC students and trying to elevate and deal with the, the pandemic of racial and social injustice that our country is facing. So I don't wanna take any more of Mary's time, but I do wanna extend um, Dr. Cooper's best well wishes and uh, acknowledgement to you as she so much appreciates all the work that all of our faculty are doing uh, as we navigate these tough times. So with that, let me turn it back over to Chris and have you give a more formal introduction of Mary. Great, thanks, thanks uh, Mary, I really appreciate it. And uh, um, it's really my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Kite. Uh, I have known Mary, uh, for a long time, for probably 15, 20 years, in very sort of a, we run in the same kind of circles way. Uh, over the last couple of years, Mary and I have worked on a couple of uh, projects together and I've gotten to know her and her work. And we've had uh, really, really terrific opportunities to, to talk about some of the issues, uh, including some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, Mary has won numerous awards and I just wanna point out, I could go through her bio but the reality is one of the most important things to recognize is besides being a really, really talented researcher who has published books on social justice and on, on prejudice and discrimination, um, she's also a very talented and dedicated educator who has won numerous teaching awards, including the highest award that our division of APA gives out, uh, the Charles Brewer Award. I wanted to make sure I gave the, the, the right name for it, uh, named after uh, one of the uh, a famous uh, psychology faculty member who um, was just a, a legend in the field. And, and to win that award is really one of the highest honors for, for people in our discipline. Uh, Mary brings a, a wealth of experience, uh, years of doing workshops and, and years of working with students, with faculty. Um, and of course, uh, those of you who are in the book group know, uh, she is one of the editors of the book that we are reading in our book group. Um, and she has done some, some wonderful work that I think uh, she'll be able to share with us tonight. I am really, really pleased to introduce uh, Mary Kite and I look forward to seeing what um, our conversation uh, is as we go through this. I would like to point out, um, just as a procedural note, uh, the chat feature is readily available. Mary will probably not address chat comments while we're working, but my two graduate associates, Eric and Gabby, are on the call and they will be recording any chat comments uh, and we'll get them to Mary to address um, towards the end of the talk. So feel free to use the chat feature if you'd like to. Um, and uh, I'd just like to turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here and I'm really grateful to Chris for inviting me and I'm happy to meet all of you virtually. I so wish we could be in person, but we all know that that is coming in the future, just not quite yet. So I want to start with just briefly saying what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about why I think social justice teaching is different from most of the other teaching we do, 
I'm going to focus on some issues related to classroom conflict and how that's linked to diversity issues. I'm going to mention briefly the benefits of teaching about social justice and diversity, and I'm going to talk a little bit about ways we can prepare ourselves and our students for those difficult moments that happen in the classroom. I also want to mention what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to give you all the answers. I don't have any guarantees. I'm not going to promise you that by the end of the talk, you will know what you're supposed to do when difficult moments come up. I'm a psychologist, so it's going to be difficult for me to address all the things that happen in other disciplines, but I will try to be broad. Um, and I'm not going to summarize the book if you haven't read it, then um, this will give you something to look forward to. But if you have read it, I'm only going to talk briefly about things that are in the book. So I wanted to say a little bit about where the book came from. Um, Chris talked about my academic journey. One thing that's kind of interesting about my particular journey is I've been at Ball State 33 years. But four years ago, I switched departments, which is such an unusual thing to do not to move into administration, but I moved from the Department of Psychological Science to the Department of Counseling Psychology, Social Psychology and Counseling. And my main reason for moving there was as a chance for me to teach doctoral students about how to teach well. So I've really enjoyed that. The genesis of this book was we wanted to write a book that would discuss from a very personal vantage point the challenges that we had experienced as co-editors teaching diversity. And we had a fabulous group of co-authors. We're so grateful for them and we are so proud of our book. And so I'm really delighted that some of you at least are getting a chance to read it. And we welcome your feedback and we're hoping there might be a follow-up where we can talk about the issues that we didn't get to. I also wanna mention briefly my website. I've discovered that if you do this till the end, you run out of time and then you don't get to um, cover it. So I just wanna mention, I have a website called Breaking the Prejudice Habit at breakingprejudice.org. And this website is a teaching related website. We have a whole bunch of group activities that were mainly developed by students who have been just wonderful partners for me um, in developing things that help with teaching about diversity and social justice. And we also have things like podcasts and video clips that are categorized by topic in case that's helpful for you. It's all free and hopefully ready to use. We made everything as ready to use as we can. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. So let's start with a little zooming. You probably know that if you go up to the top of the Zoom, you can annotate. And what I'd like for you to do is choose a stamp and look at these things that might represent some concerns you have about teaching diversity and social justice. And just put a stamp by the ones that seem to ring true to you. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Do you all know where the annotate is? Great. Thank you. I thought I fixed all the typos, but there I see one. I'll get an F at the end of the talk for having a typo on my PowerPoint. So this might be also helpful for you as you have your discussions um, as the semester goes on to think about things that maybe you can and talk about in your group. But a lot of things, um, just quickly, could somebody Maybe put in the chat some other concerns that aren't on the list. I can't see the chat, so you'll have to maybe tell me. Maybe the students can collect those. Okay. Oops, I have to clear that, otherwise it will follow me. Goodness. 
Where is the clear? There we go. Okay. All right. So I want to just talk briefly about pedagogical isolation. As I mentioned briefly, that was part of the genesis of our book, that sometimes you can feel very lonely and very stressed when you're teaching about diversity and social justice. And so um, some of that isolation can come from things that we might experience or believe. One is that our colleagues might not think what we're doing is important. They might not realize how difficult it is. They might not, um, we might not know who to ask or who to talk to, especially if we're a relatively junior faculty and it feels like um, we might want to talk to people who might be admitting that we're not adequate or competent. We might be the only person in the department who is charged with diversity issues. And we might wonder if what we're doing is valued and will be good for our career advancement. So as a consequence, we can feel pretty anxious and we can also feel burned out and frustrated and overwhelmed. And I think all of those things are of course magnified by COVID. And especially if you're trying to do these kinds of teaching um, initiatives online, I think those make it even harder than in the past. But on the positive side, we can look for support. And maybe if support isn't in our own department, we can look for other departments or we could go to the Center for Teaching and Learning. We can find places in other campuses that um, can offer support. There's a lot of listservs related to social justice teaching, for example. Um, we can be vulnerable. We can do what you're doing now and attend workshops to talk about these issues. And one thing I think we don't do enough of is to be honest with our students about how it's difficult to be an instructor of diversity related issues. You're trying to manage your emotions and their emotions and their emotions might be kind of all over the place. And finally, um, things that can help is to educate administrators, for example, about the biases in teaching evaluations that are linked to teaching diversity classes. And one thing that's been helpful for me is every once in a while to take a year off and teach something that's not so emotional, like statistics, which is emotional for a different reason because students are afraid of it. So I want to talk a little bit about conflict in the classroom. And I want to start by relating a situation that happened to me. Um, David was a student in my class, and he shared with the class that he was a server at Olive Garden and that he had this stereotypic belief that black customers are bad tippers. And you might be familiar with the self-regulation model that Margot Monteith and her colleagues have developed. And in that model, they really try to get students or anyone to recognize their biases and put the brakes on them. That once you recognize and admit your biases, then when the thought comes up, you can substitute that thought for alternative thoughts. So that's kind of where we were going. But Christy was really unhappy about me not confronting David. She thought I should have pointed out to him that he was just confirming the stereotype and that that was inappropriate for the classroom. Now, I'm not gonna address the issue of what the right answer was because I don't think there's a right answer. Um, there's always complications when you're trying to address things, but I do want to talk about why conflict in the classroom is something we're not very used to doing or familiar with unless you've been teaching these classes for a long time. So I want to start with some research um, that Brinkman and colleagues conducted. They asked women to keep diaries of when they experienced sexism and then what they did. And what's striking here is that 75% of the time they did nothing and tried to end the, and or tried to end the interaction as quickly as they could. So I think that's pretty common. We'd really rather not have confrontations for most people, that's true. Similarly, this is similar data from a study by Hires. 
She also had people keep a diary. This was broader. It wasn't just about sexism. She had people, um, racism and sexual orientation, discrimination. And notice here that even when people considered making responses, um, like verbal responses was the most common thing people said they considered, for the most part, doing nothing was the fallback. Hires also ask people what were their goals in that confrontation. And notice here, again, how big the goal of avoiding conflict is, although also notice the more positive, maybe useful goals of educating the perpetrator. Um, sometimes expressing anger might not be helpful, but might be dependent on the situation. But notice also there's this impression management piece where we worry about how we come across when we confront people. So one thing we can consider, and I wish we had more time for discussion, but I think it's useful to consider how these kinds of goals affect you in your classroom and how willing you are to address conflict when it's happening in your class. But the last thing I want to mention about confronting prejudice is that it's realistic to be worried about confronting prejudice because there are definitely costs associated with confronting prejudice. Often when people raise issues about prejudice and discrimination, for example, they're labeled as whiners, or they might be seen as taking advantage of discrimination for their own personal gain, which sometimes you hear as being instead of playing the race card. Um, black people in particular, are seen as unreasonable and overreacting if they confront a white person about prejudice. And then kind of an interesting take angle is Crosby's work that shows that if I deny discrimination and let it go by, then I don't actually have to deal with it. And dealing with conflict can be unpleasant and sometimes long standing. For example, if you filed a complaint against a colleague for sexual harassment. So letting it go is an easy step. But importantly, there are benefits. There is a clear educational function when we address prejudice. And when we do that, the person who um, spoke out feels closure and empowerment and increased self-esteem. And Boyson has an interesting study that shows that students appreciate what faculty do and rate them higher on effectiveness if they confront prejudice in their classroom. And finally, importantly, there's a lot of evidence that confronting discrimination does in fact change people's behavior. Oh, how did I get there? Okay, all right. So the last thing I want to mention, even though I said in the last slide it was the last thing, um, I always ask my students at the beginning of a class on diversity to list one fear, one concern, one hope, and one expectation. And I have that do that. In the old days, you could do it on an index card, but you could do it in a Zoom discussion. And then I have them share the cards with each other and summarize them. And this is from one of my classes, but the data are pretty consistent. Notice here, students are very worried about hurting others' feelings or offending someone. And several of you clicked that box when you were talking about the concerns you had about teaching um, in social justice classes. Um, the second one that's the most common is they're worried that people will not accept the information or won't actually learn from the class. But notice again how big the fear of disagreements and tension are. And so I think helping students at the beginning recognize that all of you feel that way, that their fellow students feel that way, that's an important revelation for them. And I also share with them how I feel and how sometimes it can be difficult for me. One thing I like to say to students is in 45 hours that we have together, I'm probably not going to get this perfectly right and we need to be able to talk about that. So we're going to do a brief breakout session, uh, just about four minutes. We don't have a whole lot of time, 
but I want you to think about how these costs and benefits play out in your classroom and whether there are norms operating in your classroom that might be related to these things um, and whether those norms can shut down discussion for you and for the students. So I'm gonna have Chris put you all in a breakout room for about four minutes and then we'll come back.
Okay, unfortunately, I've messed up my PowerPoint. I will try to get it back um, on track. Can you all see my PowerPoint? No. Uh-oh. I'm gonna have to share my screen again, I think. My apologies. I think I have zoomed down and then I don't. Uh-oh. Okay, let me just try this again. I shut my whole PowerPoint off. My apologies. Now, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Let's see. Yay, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, I wanna talk about a structure that I find very, very helpful in thinking about the kinds of conflict that we've been talking about. This is from Jeff Mio and his colleagues that he calls the five Ds of difference. And I think this is a really great way to think about where everybody is coming from. So the first D is distancing, which is exactly like it sounds, avoiding situations where one feels different, or in the discussion we've been having, maybe avoiding topics where one feels not comfortable. And I like that they break up the distance into three different components, one of which is physical distance, just absolutely not being in the same room with someone or not sitting next to someone, those kinds of distances. But there's a next second level that we don't think about as often and that's emotional distance. So one example is to think about how most people feel when they encounter someone who has maybe a physical disability that's easy, easy to spot, like perhaps a person in a wheelchair one common response is pity and sympathy. But when you think about that in terms of distancing, if that's how you're approaching that person, if that's your primary emotion, you're not letting that person have room to um, sort of show their individuality. Maybe you're not asking them questions about their major or what they like or their hobbies. You're focusing on maybe why you feel bad for them in their situation. And the third type of distancing is intellectual distancing. And this I think academics can be especially likely to do where we fall back to statistics and research studies and results of research and theories and kind of sidestep the personal feelings that people have and the personal emotions that are related to the topic. The second D is denial, which is just what you would think, denying that differences exist or minimizing them or just ignoring them. We often hear this phrased in terms of comments like, I don't see color, everybody's the same in my eyes, people are people, the only race is the human race. The problem with those kinds of statements is they assume a lot including kind of um, discounting that people don't all have the same experience, that there are inequities structurally and interpersonally. And one thing I think happens in the classroom, at least with my students, is they have a set of strategies that I call explaining away that help them with this denial, help them feel like it's okay to not talk about things they find uncomfortable. One common one is that the research studies are old, that if we did them today, they wouldn't happen. We wouldn't find that result. 
And my response to that often is to talk about Alport's very famous book, The Nature of Prejudice, which was published in 1954. If you ever get a chance to read The Nature of Prejudice, it's a wonderful book, and you'll discover that the issues that Gordon Alport raised that many years ago, 60 some years ago, are still pretty much the same thing social psychologists are talking about now. Other versions of denial are um, something else explains the behavior. There's another explanation. I'm gonna give you an example of that. And a corollary to that is the idea that prejudice is a matter of opinion. And finally, one thing I find my students doing is picking research apart. So they find a methodological flaw that they see in the study and they think that that discounts um, the findings altogether. So some of you may have heard of the elevator effect. Um, I tell my students, if you can Google image something like the elevator effect and find a picture of it, then that suggests that this is really happening. The elevator effect, if you don't know, is the idea that when people are in a closed space with someone who's different from them, often as in this example of white woman with an African-American man, they tend to pull away. And what Yancey did was ask people to explain this situation. And what he posed, the kinds of answers he got were, well, it's not really an elevator effect because it's really just her first strap broke, or she's probably claustrophobic and anxious, or my favorite, the behavior resembles racist behavior, but really you saw that behavior because she was so worried about being racist that she actually acted racist, which is a pretty convoluted way around the block. But I think the most important point Yancey makes is that notice none of those explanations are from the point of view of the black man in the elevator. None of them address his actions or how he feels. They're explaining her behavior. So they've centered the white person. And I really love this phrase. What Yancey writes is that we should just tarry with the idea that white racism exists. And I think that's a very hard thing for people to do, to um, attempt to understand how we personally will perpetuate racism how we personally might have centered the discussion on the white woman, and to think about what it means when we're forever calling into question findings that support the idea of racism. The next D of difference is defensiveness, which will seem familiar, I'm sure, to all of you, defending and protecting ourselves. It's very clear none of us like the idea that we would be considered racist or biased. Although we've certainly seen examples of people in our recent history who would own the idea of being racist, the most common person is not likely to be comfortable thinking of themselves as biased. So me and colleagues offer just a couple examples that I'll share with you. Dolly says, I had a teacher asking me, why do all the black kids hang out together? And I responded, have you noticed that the white kids also hang out together? And the teacher she was speaking to got immediately sort of flustered, defended herself. She didn't think there was anything wrong with her statement. She was just curious and noticed that um, her colleagues is missing the point that she was again, framing the problem as something about the black kids and not framing the problem as something about the white kids. Another D of difference is devaluing, what Emil and colleagues call evaluating the difference as unimportant or deficient. So what if I ask you, what side of the road do British people drive on? Maybe not all of you, but I bet for a lot of you, wrong side of the road popped up in your head, that the American way is the right way and things that aren't American are the wrong way or not the norm. I think another example happens with food. If um, you've ever been with students in a situation where they've been asked to eat unfamiliar food, they might feel perfectly comfortable even going, ooh, I've had students do that before. And the idea here 
is that it seems perfectly okay to discount things that seem weird to us, to make negative comments about, for example, clothing that looks different or unusual to us. So in a devaluing example from Mio et al., this African-American woman relate a situation where a guy says to her, I like your hair, it's pretty. It's not all ching like other black girls. And notice here that what the speaker is doing is telling her her hair is not different. And so he's not devaluing it at the same time that he's devaluing people who do have that hair that looks um, different to him. And finally, there's the D of discovery seeking opportunities. Um, this is what I think we're all aiming toward, embracing differences and learning how to deal with our discomfort and anxiety rather than avoiding it. So I wanna do another quick breakout session. And I want you to just think about where you maybe have um, participated in one of the Ds, I certainly have, or maybe where you've seen it in your class. So I'll have Chris put us back in breakout rooms for about four minutes.
So one place we see student resistance is what, and this is from Kim Case, the idea that there's traditional resistance where students just check out and don't participate. They blame the professor for their discomfort. They think that the professor has a political agenda and they may just stay silent or maybe they disrupt discussions. I've had both sides of that. And sometimes students get angry and complain. But then she makes a contrast to what she calls performative resistance, where um, people become hypercritical. They criticize the professor or their classmates. Um, they have a self-righteous attitude. They do justice explaining where they lecture other people about how they're getting things wrong. And sometimes that behavior can shut down any chance of open discussion. So can you all hear me? I've lost your faces. Yes. Okay. We can't see your screen though, Mary, if you wanted to share your screen. Oh, I will do that again. Thank you. That somehow the Zoom must make it go away. Thank you, Chris. You've all had Zoom problems, right? You're sympathetic to me struggling. Absolutely. Every day. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate that. It's where we live. Yeah, it is where we live. Here we go. So I'll just back up to that slide really quickly. Sorry about that. Um, so I think both kinds of resistance are difficult to deal with in the classroom. Um, one is the lack of engagement and the other is engagement that can be really draining um, for another reason because students are often um, expressing things that you constantly have to um, help them deal with and help the other students deal with. But good news, the anxiety about teaching social justice is normal. Um, Experience helps, but it's always going to be there, at least for me and again, most of the authors in our book. I think they all would say it never completely goes away. I think we have to think about discussion as a different skill set and spend some time training ourselves. In one of our breakout groups, we talked about how um, people didn't feel they had the experience of doing that. And it takes some doing to ramp up to manage a difficult discussion. Most of us probably were taught how to do lectures, but not taught how to have discussions about difficult issues. But you can do it. You can make a brave, safe environment. And I'm going to hopefully have a little time to get some strategies for that. So briefly, I just want to say that I think it's useful to think about your course whether you're a content teacher or a process teacher or both, but it might vary by the class. So when I teach the psychology of prejudice and discrimination, I'm a super content person. I'm interested in theories, what we know, what the data show, what questions haven't been asked yet, what's good and bad about the research. But when I teach the psychology of diversity, I'm a process person. I want the students to be culturally aware I want them to learn from other people, think about other backgrounds. Um, I want them to introspect to their own strengths and weaknesses um, and be aware of their impact on other people. And I think the course you develop, depending on whether you're a content or a process person, looks different depending on the perspective you start with. But that it's important to think about that at the very beginning of the class. And some classes I realize can blend these, but it's not easy to blend them. Um, it's easier for me to think of them as a little bit more segmented. But they go all the way back to the textbook you choose, your assignments, and how you structure the class. So we're not going to have time probably to talk about this. I'm so running out of time. 
but I want to just leave this in the record and I will leave this with Chris. Um, this is the one of the most effective discussion things I have ever come up with. And I just happened upon this list. Are these acts discrimination? And I wish we'd have time for this and maybe we can have time in the question and the answer is to talk about this a little bit. But I think the answer to the question also can differ whether you're thinking of content, like what's the data that show that these things are happening and why? how does that data lead us to our conclusions? For example, the last one, male drivers have more car accidents than female drivers is a pretty actuarial comment that we kind of tend to think is normal because that's what insurance companies do. But from a process point of view, what does that mean for the males? And if you've ever had a 16 year old boy that you paid insurance for, this might seem a little more processy to you. So I wish again, we had time to talk about this, but it's a useful thing and maybe you'd be able to use it in one of your discussion groups. Um, so just let me mention briefly some strategies that I have found very helpful in the classroom. And maybe this will help some of you that haven't um, taught diversity issues. One of the most useful things I do is have students write about difficult issues in advance. So maybe have them do a reading and write a reflection, and then I read it before we have the discussion. And that gives me a lot of information about where the students are, where they're coming from, and what the roadblocks and potholes might be during the discussion so I can be more prepared. Another thing that I find really, really helpful is when you're talking about a difficult topic to let every student comment, and it doesn't have to be long, but the key here is that this, no one can respond, no matter what anyone says, no one can have a counter discussion until every student has spoken. And this lets students feel really safe because they know that they're not gonna get jumped on for if they don't get the phrasing quite right. And it also gives you a chance to kind of notice where some of the road, you know, again, roadblocks might be and gives you a chance to sort of organize how you can address things that come up. I don't usually call on reticent students, but other people do that effectively. Another really effective strategy if you have people who dominate the discussion is to have a talisman of some kind that the students have to hold before they talk. One thing that happens in that situation is the students don't pass the chalk to the dominating person. So they get to kind of help control the discussion for you. And finally, it's important to know you can stop discussion. And sometimes you need overnight to think about how to address the issues. So finally, just really quickly, I want to talk about reasons why diversity is important for the students. So some of you may know that APA's guidelines for the undergraduate major, there are five major goals. One is social cultural awareness. And what I really like about the way they frame this is they're inviting us to, yes, acknowledge conflict and oppression and the negative parts that are related to social justice, but also to focus on how we can respond to and resolve these issues and how we can have positive outcomes that promote diversity and not just focus on the downside. There's a lot of positive upsides as well. And just really quickly, some things that students benefit from. There's a lot of data that show that diversity is enriching for our students, that it's very important for our students to be trained related to diversity issues. Evidence that improves their critical thinking and problem solving, evidence that classrooms where people feel welcome and accepted results in higher achievement for both the underrepresented group members and the members who are not from underrepresented groups. And students report the climate in general feels more welcoming when diversity is addressed. Students' attitudes are less prejudiced when they've had diversity training. They're more likely to care about the community and to, involved in, to be involved in political affairs. 
And when they know about diversity and can speak about it well, they're more likely to get an internship and more likely to get a job. So these are just some little small pieces of the direct student impact of diversity related teaching. And finally, I just want to mention, if you know about the idea of stereotype threat, that people have concerns about confirming a stereotype and that actually can lead them to perform worse than if they don't have those concerns. There are ways that you can reduce stereotype threat in your classroom that benefit students, including making sure the students understand that tests don't show gender differences, that that's not the purpose of the test. For example, in math, emphasizing that women in fact can do math and they can do it as well as men can. Um, teaching people that there is such a thing as stereotype threat in and of itself will reduce it and providing positive information that say, for example, in my class, everyone, I don't have a bias where one group performs worse than the other. And finally, showing people about diversity, role models in your discipline who have been successful. For example, simply by showing photographs of people from your discipline who are um, good examples of how the students too can be in that successful group. So I wanna close quickly, briefly, with a quote from the Talmud that I think is really helpful. You're not required to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And I love that quote because it gives us all a charge, but it also tells us we're not gonna solve the problems overnight. So I thank you so much. I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for a discussion or that some of the discussion topics were maybe um, a little too fast for you to really think them through. So uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, we, you can put questions in the chat or I suspect you can just ask them uh, if anyone has any questions. Hi, this is Elizabeth. So I have a kind of unorthodox question that I'm curious okay. to hear your thoughts on. So um, we, we're in a little bit of a different social climate this past year. Um, mm -hmm. There's the pandemic issue, but also all of um, the racial tensions that are going on. And one thing I'm wondering in your discussions with other teachers, if you've heard about or if you have thoughts on responding to would be um, students who in their own stages of identity development and understanding of race are actually overly critical of teachers in the other direction, rather than denying that racism exists, they're very critical of maybe the way that an instructor might frame an issue of social justice that doesn't sound radical enough to them um, and therefore isn't um, taking into account the atrocities that they think the professor should pontificate about for 45 minutes and, and they're not adequately discussing um, uh, all of that. And I was wondering if you feel like similar conflict techniques are going on here or um, how to work with students who are in that kind of um, stage themselves. Boy, so I think um, students do expect a lot. Um, and I think it's very hard for students to take your perspective on how and why you can't solve all the world's problems. Um, and they might, because one thing I tell my students is I have information about what everyone in the class thinks and feels. And I'm trying to balance a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different developmental stages so that while I might really like to have everybody where they are, 
it's not really possible or feasible. And I think that is one strategy you can use that's helpful um, to let the students understand that you can't just, um, you might maybe see everything and present things just exactly the way they like to, or they would like for you to. Um, I have to tell you last semester, I got frustrated with the students and said, we are teaching a gender class and they complain constantly about the book. And I finally just said, you know, when you write the book, you can do a better job. But right now, this is the book we have. And I think they did better than anyone else. So here's where we are. <laughs> um, but I do think we're seeing more of it um, than we used to. And I think that's a really good point. And maybe someone else has some thoughts that I missed about what they might do. Uh, Mary, Tony Hill has a question. Too. Okay. Uh, Mary, thank you for your. Oh, I'm thank sorry. You, Mary, thank you very much for your very engaging uh, conversation and uh, really, really surfaced some some great strategies. So I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. We have. Uh, I'm from the School of Social Work, and we have a very diverse group of students who were very active participants in the Black Lives Matter protest, and you know, non-traditional students working. Uh, jobs, taking care of family, uh, parents, children. Um, so they really wanted to go there as far as advocating for social justice. What methods do you think that would be helpful in working with students, as you mentioned, at different stages, different developmental levels? And wanted to ask you a question about uh, affinity groups. So having a space for white students and who are learning about this, who want to do something, but may feel shut down. So just, just interested in, in your thoughts about how to work with students who may be at different levels. Um, one thing I try to do in my classroom is give them assignments that are advocacy related or social justice related, but that they can start where they are. So in my gender class last semester, um, everybody had to do something related to advocacy and they could pick up the things that were really important to them and do some literature reviewing and develop. I really wanted them to have an outcome. Um, so a lot of them in COVID situations um, were doing Zoom presentations to certain groups. Um, and I think those kinds of assignments, if you can build them in all along the way, are very helpful in terms of letting students start from where they are and um, not requiring them to all be in the same place. And I think one key to that is to make sure that the grading rubric acknowledges that they can be wherever they are, because I think students are very afraid that they're going to be graded badly for having, quote, the wrong thoughts. Um, and I try really hard to set up rubrics so that students get graded on outcomes and um, accuracy and not opinions. So even if they put their opinion, um, that's not what I'm grading them on. And I think that is also helpful for people where they are. I've never had an affinity group or tried an affinity group. Um, I think that's a really good idea. Um, I do in one of my classes, I have a group every once a week, a subgroup within the class meets together and has a, a guided discussion. And I always think um, they might want to change groups or dislike their groups, but they really don't. They find that really effective to have the same five people that they talk to week after week, and they can sort of develop together and sometimes the students can bring along, um, the more you know, advanced students can bring along the students that are less advanced. And I think that's very effective. So it's sort of like an affinity group where you let the students um, help you with that process so it's not just you. But again, I think the key to that is you have to be very deliberate about the questions that they consider and give them a framework for the discussion because I don't think a free for all can um, help them sometimes with those very difficult differences. So, so Mary, um, 
I, uh, I got a, a question I'd, I'd just like to bring up, and it's one that is, it's, it's ironic because as I look around the, the Zoom room, I see at least two committee members that are going to be sitting with me tomorrow morning, bright and early, related to this topic. And that is, um, there are junior faculty, and I think it's not just at our institution, but at institutions across the country who are concerned with um, the impact of these kinds of conversations on student evaluations and how that might track into later um, issues with promotion and tenure. And I'm just curious if you can comment a little bit on that uh, issue and, and what your thoughts are there. I think that risk is very real. And I think um, it's really important that the administrators are well aware of the biases in teaching evaluations and the appropriate way to interpret them. I think we also need to be well aware of how much negative comments stick and positive comments don't. So that for the professor, the untenured person, that one negative comment might feel really overwhelming to them. And that can be the whole takeaway from their evaluation. So I think framing their evaluations, helping them frame their evaluations so that they can look at the positives and make sure they remember them. One thing um, my colleague has learned about that's happening at some institutions is they have someone read your evaluations and filter them and give you the formative summative information without you having to read the comment that kind of stabs you in the heart. I think that's a really nice thing to think about but also that when evaluators um, look at people's student evaluations in promotion and tenure, that they're also trained not to zero in on that one negative comment that the student has, and not also to make something out of mean differences that isn't there. So probably the difference between a five on a five point scale and a four on a five point scale is not meaningful. But we tend to look at that and say, oh, that person is a whole point lower. So Chris is not as good as me, right? And that is not useful. So I think teaching evaluations can provide us a lot of great information, but we have to be responsible as senior faculty and administrators for making sure they're used the way they are intended and not misused and misunderstood. Thank you. That's very helpful information. Um, any other questions or, or, or thoughts? I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat too. Mary, I'd like to personally thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us and um